Now, it turns out that the Bible actually has a lot to say about money. That may surprise us. In fact, uh, someone has done the math and looked at words that relate to money, management, power, finance, property, and all those derivatives, and figured out that about 2,500 times these things are mentioned in Scripture. That's a lot. It's a lot more than it talks about faith or love or hope. Uh, so money must be important. And when we look at the life of Jesus, uh, you may still have one of those red letter Bibles at home, all the words of Jesus in red. Well, when, when you look at that and, and somebody did the math again, all those red letters, all those words ascribed to Jesus, it appears in the gospel that Jesus is talking about money or wealth, property, finance, uh, using it as a foil or as an object lesson in some way or another, uh, about 62 or 3% of the time. Uh, so if your preacher's preaching the gospel and you're showing up regularly for church, your preacher might always be talking about money or at least two thirds of the time and actually being faithful to scripture. It's an important issue. It's a spiritual issue. Uh, and, and we need to understand how it impacts us spiritually. Jesus says some kind of strange things about money when they first fall on our ear anyway. They sound strange. Jesus says, for example, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I have always tended to hear that in my mind differently, that where my heart is, that's sort of where my treasure naturally follows. I'll just invest in the things that I love. And uh, No, that's not what Jesus says. <laughs> Jesus knows us all too well. And he basically says, your checkbook is a theological document. If you want to know what really matters to you, your, your church budget is a theological document. If you want to know where the priorities are, take a look at that. You'll know that your treasure, that's where your heart is. The heart follows the treasure. So we need to understand that as a working principle in our lives. The Bible uh, talks about it in a variety of ways. Jesus goes on to say, uh, for example, uh, no one can serve two masters. Uh, for you love one, hate the other, hate one, love the other. You can't serve God and mammon both. Now, this is in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel. And, and what Jesus is making very clear is and mammon is money. Let's make no mistake about that either. Uh, that, that money can make a very, very powerful servant, but a very cruel taskmaster. You think about that. It, it, as our master, that relationship where we serve our money does not work. It does not enhance our lives. It does not enhance the world or the community in which we live. But, but money employed in service of the realm of God, that's a different story. Um, we need to understand that and, and, and hear those words very clearly. Um, they're reminiscent of what the author of 1 Timothy says in the sixth chapter, uh, that the love of money is the root of all evil, not money. We need to hear that distinction. I, I think most of us sort of have a memory of the text as money is the root of all evil, but that's not what it says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil, that, that, the, that the desire to acquire, that, the, that, that your focus only being on the bottom line and wealth and, and acquiring more and more um, ultimately destroys your life. Uh, it, it destroys human community. It, dis, it can destroy a business when the only line is the bottom line. And, and, and we know this, and we don't need a lot of anecdotal stories of how in the name of, of quarterly profits, not even annual profits, but just quarterly profits, thousands of jobs have been lost and lives turned upside down and ruined, or how choices have been made that really negatively impact the environment and the world in which we live in, in order to show the shareholders uh, some kind of gain. Um, we've known people for for whom the acquisition of more wealth has destroyed their families and all of their relationships. And, and, and while it seems like they got a lot of nice stuff, they're all alone with their stuff. Um, I think that's an important lesson for us. The Bible will go on to say in some of the epistles in, in both Colossians and Ephesians, some things that are worthy of note for us, uh, that greed is not good or appropriate for the saints, and that certainly makes all kinds of sense. And, and also the warning, and, and we know this, that money can become an idol, that, that, uh, that it has its own form of idolatry. Uh, who doesn't like to look at their quarterly or annual statements in their portfolio if you're planning for retirement? How your wealth is growing or at least some money is growing that you'll have in the future and and you can you can get distracted by that 
and the pursuit to have that grow and increase can can impact your life negatively. It can cause you to make poor choices if that's all you're focused on. And so what we need to be aware of is that the Bible is relatively value neutral about wealth. That, that may surprise us, but the Bible really isn't concerned about having a lot or not having a lot of wealth. What it is more concerned about is what happens to us when we have or don't have a lot of wealth. That's really its largest concern. How does it impact our relationships and what is our relationship with our stuff? That's what really matters in the biblical witness. Uh, the stuff itself is, is not the problem. Uh, it's our relationship with that stuff. Now, we think it's helpful to do a financial autobiography. We think it's, it's really useful to reflect about the role that money has played in your life and your relationship with money over time. And, and you can do this even in a group setting. Sometimes it's helpful in a church finance uh, committee to, to, to explore this with folks, to ask the question, for example, what was your first job? Uh, what did you do? How much did you make an hour? And what did you do with the money that you earned? Uh, this is a fascinating discussion because you'll hear all kinds of stories around that. For some folks, the money that they earned, they could do whatever they wanted with it. They might have uh, just used it for gas in the car or, or clothes or, or whatever it is they wanted. For other folks, it, it may have been necessary to help little brother get a pair of shoes or, or to buy the family's dinner for tomorrow night. Uh, and understanding that those different dynamics come into a finance committee with us at church is is pretty important. Then you might explore a little further. Uh, what was your relationship with money in the church? When did you first start giving money at the church? Not just the quarter that mom and dad gave you to drop in the plate if you grew up in the church, but, but did, did you get money as an allowance and have to take a portion out or choose to take a portion out to give? Uh, how did you decide what was the right amount? These are good questions to ask and they help define our relationship about money. And we do that in a group context. We get a better understanding of all that's at play in the room and why some folks respond the way they do. Um, having that appreciation and awareness can help us make better decisions together and, and, and have greater appreciation for folks who seem to kind of get stuck in one place or another. And isn't that a part of what being in community is and understanding one another and seeing here that the, the elephant in the room <laughs> is often money. Uh, so it's good to understand how it impacts us. Uh, that, that, that wealth is not bad, despite our sense that Jesus seems to beat up on rich people a lot, he really doesn't. What he, what he challenges is what happens when we use our wealth to insulate ourselves against others, uh, or when we believe that our wealth uh, takes away our need for God and our dependence on God for provision. Uh, so having that right relationship with our money, the Bible wants us to consider and be really aware of.